U.S.-China trade tensions continue to grow. We also, of course, have news from Friday that perhaps President Trump will impose tariffs on Mexico and actually said over the past 24 hours or so that he's really okay with imposing tariffs on Mexican exports to the United States. So let's get some perspective on what's going on with trade. For that, we're joined by Rana Ambrose, NAFTA Advisory Council member and also former interim leader of the Conservative Party. Rana, great to be able to catch up with you today. Thanks so much for your time as always. Good to be with you. Let me let me get your perspective for our viewers in terms of how we should be interpreting these current trade negotiations. We were always focused on NAFTA, but let's talk first and foremost U.S. China, then Mexico, then NAFTA. Well, I mean, the, the tension between the U.S. China on trade continues, and of course, as you well know, rocks the market every time a new uh, some new salvo is shot across the bow from either of the sides. Uh, you know, I, I think from a political point of view, a lot of people watching think, you know, how how long can the Chinese hold out? Because obviously, the tariffs have an implic an, a, a serious economic implications for them, but as well as the United States. Of course, we also know that the U.S. is willing to take an economic hit to for long-term gain in terms of their rectifying a trade imbalance with China. You know, add on top of that all of the issues around Huawei and the Americans wanting to see Huawei be banned not only in the United States, but asking all of their allies to do, do the same thing and purge Huawei from all of their telecommunications. Of course, that's a huge economic blow to the credibility and legitimacy of a large Chinese um, company. So it, it, there's multi-layers here, um, a lot going on, but stuck in the middle is Canada. Of course, we are implicated in the Huawei issue. We are implicated in what happens with China U.S. trade. Here we were just a few years ago hoping to strike a, a deal of our own with China, and that has obviously taken a, way, a big backseat to what's happening between the U.S. and China right now. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's talk then a little bit about Canada because we are stuck in the, the middle of so many different layers here. Uh, what do you think should be the right approach for Canada, specifically surrounding Huawei? Well, I think... We have to listen. First of all, uh, the U.S. is our biggest trading partner and our greatest ally. And our own security agencies have many times talked about their concerns around Huawei technology. Uh, we also have to think about it from a competitiveness point of view. Um, do we want to support North American companies, Canadian companies to be the ones to break, f break through in terms of 5G? networks and technology or do we want to see competitors like Huawei be able to reach that first? What are the public safety implications? What are the economic implications? And I think all of those things are being discussed um, in governments uh, across North America at, at the provincial, state and, and national and federal level. Um, but the, the U.S. has been quite clear what they'd like to see Canada do. Um, and of course we've even heard from our telecommunications companies how much it would cost to purge Huawei out of our telecommunications systems. It could be up to a billion dollars. Um, and this all, all of this complicates our relationship with China because mm -hmm. we've said, you know, the Prime Minister has said for the last couple of years he wants to see more engagement with China, more business with China back and forth. Um, but of course, what our largest, uh, you know, our largest um, trade partner and our greatest ally says matters a lot to us and it should. So mm -hmm. again, Canada is stuck in the middle of a very difficult issue when it comes to Huawei. What, what do you think the timing might be in terms of Canada's decision here? Do we, it sounds like we might have time to make this decision. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, I, I think that, that the, the, one, the one advantage we have is that Trump is not pushing us, at least publicly right now. Um, and that's helpful to us. I mean, he has his sights elsewhere. I think uh, Vice President Pence's visit to Canada was a clear overture to show Canada that we, that there is a positive relationship between the two countries, that the U.S. sees us as an ally when it comes to the USMCA and an ally when it comes to other issues globally. So let's hope that this mm -hmm. renewed relationship uh, continues and, and hopefully that'll give us some time to make a decision on Huawei, which has public safety implications on one hand, but also economic implications and figure out what the best path forward is for Canada. Hmm. Um, speaking of USMCA, it, it, all three countries 
are interested to move forward with this, but at the same time, it's now gotten even more complicated just as of last week with respect to President Trump willing to impose tariffs on Mexico. What, in your conversations with Canada's trade representatives, what, what does this mean in terms of our expectations? Well, you know, nothing ever surprises me anymore with Donald Trump. Just when we thought, you know, the ribbon was tied and the paperwork signed, that we were moving forward to ratify through all of our houses of our elected chambers, the, the USMCA, to move this forward and get this done, uh, all of a sudden Trump throws another wrench into it. And it's a political wrench, let's remember. He's trying to use any lever available to him to meet his political goals. And in this case, he is also um, impacting uh, what we hoped would be a, the successful ratification of the USMCA. But his political goal is to stop illegal migration from Mexico and other parts of South America and Latin America into the United States through Mexico. And he hasn't been able to build his wall. He keeps being stymied by the Democrats and other actors in Congress. And so what does he do? He thinks, well, let's put pressure on the Mexicans. Maybe they can help me achieve my political goal, which is if it's not build a wall, then definitely decrease the amount of, of illegal migration. So uh, he's very serious about it. And when we've heard him say over and over again in the last week how serious he is about it, and if he imposes, you know, 5 percent uh, tariffs on all uh, on all Mexican goods coming into the U.S. and then continues to escalate those tariffs up to 25 percent. That's a serious economic blow to the Mexican economy. And uh, and potentially as we continue to see tariffs imposed, whether it's from China or on China, what have you, um, we are seeing manufacturing globally slow down. Rana, I'm, I'm curious, with all the people um, that you're in touch with, that you have access to, as we sit here, it's almost as though we're just sitting here waiting for something to happen as we continue to digest these news headlines. Um, what, what's one of the more interesting comments you've heard as it relates to how this plays out or how we need to be thinking about this current situation? You know, I mean, I'll say today what I said a, a year ago. NAFTA is still in place. And so, yes, every time Trump does some of the things that he does, it rocks the markets, our economies. Obviously, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of um, opportunity lost in terms of, of potential trade. But at the end of the day, for Canada, I think we have to stay focused on the fact that NAFTA is still in place. There's still a lot of goods and services crossing our border every day. Uh, we also have to remember that the USMCA is something that President Trump is proud of. He brags about it. He wants to see it get through Congress. Um, that's a positive thing for us. I think right now this fight between Mexico and the U.S. is squarely about using that lever because he's running out of levers to achieve his other political goals, which is building a wall and finding a way to stymie uh, illegal immigration from Mexico into the U.S. Canada has to stay focused on making sure we ratify the USMCA through Parliament. The government has introduced the legislation to do that, and we should get it done as quickly as possible. The Mexicans, continue, they've introduced the legislation in their chamber. Uh, hopefully, things will move smoothly. Um, with support of Nancy Pelosi and others uh, in the U.S. through Congress. Um, so, you know, when you kind of strip away the politics of it, things continue to slowly move along. Mm -hmm. this, this tariff war with Mexico obviously is a concern, and I think the Mexicans are hoping that they can convince President Trump that they are doing everything they can to stop the flow of illegal migration into the U.S. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they might have to do more. I mean, a la what happened with, uh, with uh, the steel and aluminum sector and tariffs, there was uh, some kind of a uh, negotiated agreement that showed that Mexico and Canada were going to do more to make sure that uh, they were uh, stopping the flow of cheap steel and aluminum, particularly cheap steel coming in through their borders and into the United States. So. We'll see uh, if the Mexicans f can find a way past this, mm -hmm. but I do think that Trump is serious about this issue, but I think we also have to recognize that he does want to see the USMC a ratified, mm -hmm. um, and he does need the support of both countries to make that happen. Mm -hmm. let's, all, let's remember, if the three countries do not ratify, it will not happen. Right. So he does need the Mexicans. 
Rana, shifting focus here just a little bit, um, you introduced uh, Bill C-337 that I think is finally getting heard tonight after a long waiting period from your perspective, I believe. Can you just give us a bit of a background in terms of what it is and sure. what, what we hope to achieve? Yeah. Well, this bill I introduced when I was leader of the opposition a couple of years ago, and it's been languishing in the Senate and blocked by the Senate after unanimously supported by all political parties in Canada in the House of Commons for 750 days. So it's being heard tonight. Uh, so that's great. We hope to get it through. What this bill does is uh, mandate training in sexual assault law uh, for judges and to make sure that when uh, someone comes forward to report a sexual assault and they actually take it to trial, which is a pretty difficult, courageous thing to do, that the least they can expect is to have a judge presiding over their trial that knows sexual assault law and understands the social context around things like stereotyping of women, um, using bias. Uh, so there's a, it's, it's a good bill. It's been supported by many, many groups across the country, whether it's lawyers, judges, law enforcement, victims, advocates, and we hope that it'll be supported tonight by the Senate of Canada. Why was this, I, I think a lot of people would, would hear about this and say, well, why, I wouldn't even think that a judge would, would need um, sexual assault training. Yeah, unfortunately, there's instances where lawyers are uh, lawyers are appointed to become judges and they could be energy sector lawyers, corporate lawyers, property law lawyers, I mean I, real estate lawyers and all of a sudden they're a judge and they have a sexual assault law case in front of them and they haven't actually had training in sexual assault law. Sexual assault law in particular, which is why we introduced this bill, is the most complex area of law. And if you don't know it very well, then you can make some serious mistakes. And in the last month alone, the Supreme Court of Canada overturned two cases where they flat out said that judges got it completely wrong and made errors in the law. And that's just two. There's been four in Alberta in the last two years. Um, and there's a number uh, of other cases across the country. So as I said, when you think about the fact that one in three women in Canada will experience sexual violence in their lifetime, but only one in 10 will report it, um, there's a problem there. And so when we asked women, Justice Canada asked women, why don't you report? They said they don't have faith in the court system. Mm. So we need, to build, uh, we need to build that faith in the court system and in our judiciary. And the way to do that is through really good training uh, and education. So uh, that's what the bill is about, is to mandate education to make sure that um, those who are presiding over these very complex cases have the best training possible. Understood. And it goes to the Senate tonight. Which, And then if they vote goes yes, to the Senate it means tonight. what? It means it has to go to one more vote, back to the House of Commons, and then it would become a law.